Hello, welcome to the first video for Big Idea One. And Big Idea One is this kind of sentence right here. And um, it says chemical elements are the fundamental building blocks of matter, building materials of matter. Everything can be, can be understood in terms of arrangements of atoms, and these atoms retain their identity. And basically what that's saying is everything's made of atoms. Atoms go together and make compounds, molecules, you know, cells, trees, whatever, the whole thing. Um, and that those atoms never change. While your compounds will change, you know, this will, this will, you know, if you take wood and you burn it, that uh, the big old cellulose molecules will change into carbon dioxide and and ash and, and these things. So, so the the compounds and all these things change, but the the carbon will never change. The carbon in the wood, carbon in the carbon dioxide is still carbon. So, um, so within that though, there's a lot more to big idea one than that. Uh, that little statement right there is very big kind of general statement um, and if you look at this little word picture right here that is pretty pretty neat um, and these are all the things that are included in that big idea one even though uh, it doesn't really seem so when you look at it um, so we're going to try to cover all these things so take a quick glance and look at that and we try to get into as many of those ideas as we possibly can um, one of the biggest things that um, will come up and that you really have to know a lot about is uh, what is the periodic table and how do I use it? So the periodic table right here ranges all of those elements and you have to know um, a lot about this and just what's going on here. So we have groups going up and down, we have periods going side to side, um, the groups will arrange the atoms by properties so all of these will have very similar properties. Um, and valence electrons is a big deal as well. So in group one, there's one electron in the outermost energy level. Why is that important? Well, that's important because that one electron in the outer energy level is what interacts with the other elements, let's see. And so, so um, like say this one has one, uh, these ones over here have seven, so it's very common to see this one with one and this one with seven get together because atoms would like to have eight electrons in their outer shell. So knowing how many electrons are in the outer shell predicts a lot of, of chemistry. So this would be one, this is two, and as we go over here it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, the periods going across uh, typically tell you energy levels. So we're going to talk about energy levels a little bit later, but as you go across this will tell you they're all energy level number one electrons. This one has all its outermost one in energy level number two, three, and so on and there's some some differences in energy level as you get into d block and f block and we'll talk about that when we get there as well you do have to know about um, the symbols pretty simple stuff uh, the big whole number this one right here is the number of protons it's always the same so iron will always have 26 protons the number of neutrons though may change which is why you have this down here this is the number of neutrons plus protons Okay, so uh, you see it's 55.845. That doesn't mean we have a partial neutron. What it means is that we have uh, isotopes. So in the case of iron, uh, you may have two isotopes. You might have uh, one isotope that has 26 protons. Oops, got to get that turned into a pen. 26 protons and one that has 30, right? So the one that has 26 will have a mass of 52, right? Because 26 protons plus 26 neutrons. Um, I think I said protons when I meant neutrons a little bit earlier. But 26 protons plus 26 neutrons, 52. So let's say that makes up 30% of the total we find in nature. And let's say that the one with 30 neutrons, uh, which would give us um, a total of, uh, of 56, makes up 70% of what we find in nature. Right, so the mass of 56 is what we find most commonly. So what they would do is they would multiply 56 times 70%, 52 by 30%, and they would get an average. And that's what this is. It's an average of all of those isotopes. And one thing you can do with this is you can predict, well, which isotope occurs most often? Well, you just have to look at this average, look at your isotope numbers, and say, I think it's this one because uh, this number, average number, is closer to that one, and sure enough, it is that 70%, and that's 30. I just made these numbers up. I know it doesn't actually mathematically match up to that, but um, who's counting, right? So let's go ahead and get rid of that and that. Um, very big deal in chemistry, and especially in these initial um, parts of chemistry, is the idea of a mole. Now, a mole is the number 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And it's just a number. So 
It's a huge number though, and the reason we have a huge number is so that we can count atoms. So we count eggs with a dozen. So if I was to tell you that there's 12 dozen eggs, that would be 12 times 12. So you know there's 144 total. So if I told you I had a mole of eggs, I would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd eggs. If I had that many eggs, it would cover the earth so deep that it would probably have eggs all the way out to the moon. See, this is a big number. But when we're talking about atoms, um, they're so small that we need a big number like this just to know um, how many how many we have, just to even get some semblance of, of, of anything. If you go back to the periodic table, oops, that's not it. You go back to the periodic table right here, um, you'll see that the mass number, which is right here, is actually the amount of mass it needs to have one mole. So in iron, 55.845 is the amount of grams it takes to get exactly 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So that mass number on the periodic table is handy because it will actually tell you the exact amount of mass needed to get one mole. Now moles, it's very important to use moles because mole kind of standardizes everything. Whereas if you have, uh, you know, um, 10 grams of carbon and 10 grams of hydrogen, you're not even going to have a full mole of carbon, but you'll have 10 grams of, or 10 moles of hydrogen. See, so see, each of these atoms weighs a different amount. So um, once we convert into moles, we've got everything in the same playing field. So often we convert things to moles. So for example, if I told you that I had, um, you know, let's say that I had 110 grams of iron, right? 110 grams of iron. Well, I found out from my periodic table that, um, that it was 55.845 grams per one mole, right? So what I could do is I could say if 110 grams, 55 grams per one mole, well, in this case, I have about two moles, right? Um, so, you know, I have about two moles there. And, um, and so that's a really easy way to figure out how many moles you have. All you got to do is weigh it out, divide it by the molar mass you find on the table. Um, so that would work with solids very nicely. But what if you have gases? Well, when you have gases and they're not at uh, what we call STP, you would use this equation right here. And this equation normally is PV equals NRT. It's the ideal gas law. So number of moles is right here. But you can rearrange it so it says number of moles equals pressure times volume divided by the R constant times the temperature in Kelvin. So you could use that to solve for moles as well if you were talking about gases. Now, it's even more simple when you have gases at STP. And STP is always zero degrees Celsius or uh, 273 degrees Kelvin um, and uh, one ATM. So the pressure would be one ATM. And at that temperature and pressure, one mole of any gas is always 22.4. So that kind of simplifies things. So if I had a mole of, of gas, um, you know, carbon gas, if I had a mole of hydrogen gas, if I had a mole of... Um, argon gas wouldn't matter. They would always be the same. They'd always be 22.4 liters per mole. Um, so that's the mole. Another thing that comes up oftentimes with uh, figuring this out is percent composition. Composition, Because everything is made up of atoms, so everything has a percentage of uh, total amount of, of, of the compound, right, per atom. So if I was to look at, at this right here, uh, the equation actually for percent composition is, is, is this right here. So the equation is um, the total mass of the element divided by the total mass of the, uh, this, of the compound, right? Um, and so um, if I was to look at this, um, like let's say I have glucose right here. Glucose has uh, six carbons, uh, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. So let's say that I had 72.06 grams of carbon, uh, 12 grams of hydrogen, 96 grams of oxygen. What's the percentage of mass? Well, it's really simple. All you need to know is the amount of grams per element and then the total to find percentage. You know, just like a score on a test, you want to know the amount that you scored divided by the total amount possible. So that's how you do percent composition. Real simple. Um, I'll just throw, you know, the... the uh, the equations up here for you to see. So if I divided by the total here, mass of the element divided by that, you have 40% carbon, uh, it'd be 6.7% hydrogen, and 53.3% oxygen. Another thing that comes up 
um, as we go along is the idea of um, molecular compounds versus empirical compounds. So if I was to look at a molecular compound versus an empirical compound, um, the, the, the simple answer is that a molecular compound is how it's found in nature. The molecule is how it's found in nature. Empirical is just the lowest possible ratio you can get. So, um, like, for example, if we look at, uh, at our compound here, C6H12O6, is that a molecular formula or an empirical? Well, it's not the lowest possible ratio. The lowest possible ratio is CH2O right? Um, so because we could divide all this by six. So this is our empirical. This right here is our empirical. And this right here is our molecular. So how would we figure out molecular versus empirical? Well, this is what typically ends up happening. Typically what ends up happening is you get the, a lot of times they'll give you the percentage data like we calculated before. They may start off giving you the percentage data. So if you had percentage data, you could just convert to moles. So whenever you're solving for a molecular empirical, your first step is always convert to moles. So to convert to moles, just like we learned earlier, you're going to divide by the molar mass. So if this was 40%, I'd divide 40% by 12 or 40. Uh, you essentially take these percentages and treat them like they're masses. Um, so I divide that by 12 because that's the mass of carbon on the periodic table. I get 3.33. Hydrogen divided by 1, get 6.71, and oxygen divided by 16, 3.33. So you'll see that the ratio that we ended up here with was, was 3 point, basically 3 to 6 to 3. So if I simplify that out, it is uh, 1 to 2 to 1. And so if you, look at, uh, if you look at what we've got here, this ratio right here is 1 to 2 to 1. So doing this method right here will always give you the empirical, right? Um, so to find the molecular, if they were to give you a problem like this, to find the molecular, well, they'd need to give you the total molar mass of the compound. So if the total molar mass of this compound, we know, is 180. Sorry about that. My pen's starting to get a little goofy on me, but that's okay. So it's 180. Um, if we were to take this and add it all up, it would come up to about 30. So one carbon's 12, plus two is 14, plus 16 is 30. So I would say, okay, well, my empirical told me my mass was 30. They told me my actual mass was 180. So if I divide 30 into 180, well, sure enough, there's 6. And so I would say, okay, my molecular formula is my empirical times 6, which there you go. There's your molecular formula, C6H12O6. So that's the difference between molecular and empirical. Oftentimes, things are expressed as empiricals and... Um, and sometimes we need to know what their molecular is. And so to solve for molecular, they have to give you the actual molar mass. So this is the actual molar mass of the molecule. Um, if they don't give you the molar mass, you can't solve for it. And you can only get the empirical by doing this method I showed you right here. Hope that helps and hope that puts you on your way to being able to solve all the percent composition, molecular versus empirical, and understanding a little bit about elements and the way that they go together.